So what are the common issues you find um, coaches are working with when, they, when they're working with especially high-level individuals within business and, you know, like the CEOs, managing directors and, and things like that? Well, I, I think uh, what we were saying is getting the internal obstacles out of the way are very, very important to begin with. And I think we always have to get that out of the way anyway. And I, I unfortunately, I don't think enough people have um, seen the significance of the Galway process that uh, was very, very important because he was the first person to really identify these internal obstacles. And I think that's not broadly spread enough yet. Right. Um, and, I, and I would say that's where a lot of people go wrong. Uh, what I find quite interesting in, in, in corporate coaching is the number of people, they, they, they say that, you know, they need corporate coaching because they want to improve the performance of their company in this area and this area of the business is a bit weak and that sort of thing. And uh, you get into a coaching conversation with these people. And, uh, you know, you're only half an hour into the conversation and they're talking about their relationship with their wife or their children <laughs> and things like that. And they, what they actually want is personal coaching. I mean, it's actually their um, inability to talk to people, other people, about a lot of the things that bother them that very often brings them to coaching in the first place. Yes. And they put a business label on it to get you talking to them and then they find that they're dealing with something else, you know. <laughs> You just unleash a whole host of other things that you know, internal stuff that's been bottled up, and then, and then they, you're there for hours. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. But I mean, I think it's very important to take a, a broad view on coaching. I mean, I believe if somebody, you know, has got a difficult relationship within their family, for example, obviously that's going to affect their work performance. So it's perfectly valid to work on uh, uh, somebody's uh, personal issues. Um, if they find it is interfering with their work. So I don't have a problem with it. Okay. So when you're coaching, um, what are you looking to test throughout the interaction to ensure that the sessions are going along the right path? Well, um, I mean, I think that you're looking at the emotions going on in the other person because uh, I, I think you can recognize very often when the person is feeling a relief and sometimes they they feel a relief because they've been that they've they've realized something that they haven't quite said before but it's become clear and I think it's useful to recognize that mm. uh, as well so I think I think you know watching the person and hearing the person is very very important again it's the people skills that's crucially important mm. But I think, and I mean, just coming into our into our modern times now, in the, the sort of period of difficulty that we're facing at the moment, multiple difficulties that um, that uh, a lot of business people have today in the yeah. economic things and the environmental threats and all that sort of thing. Um, of course, we have a really different thing because our principle in coaching. I mean, let's take an example. I mean, let's say somebody is a shoe manufacturer. Well, I'm not going to go in and tell somebody how they should make shoes, um, but I can help them look at the efficiency of their organization. Mm. But, um, but also, um, it, it, the context of much business now is actually the changing things in the world. The economic crisis is an obvious example for business. And does the, the CEO know enough about what's going on in the world because they're so focused uh, on their business, and sometimes their main focus is this month's bottom line, which is a very short-term and very materialistic vision. Um, and there are all sorts of other things going on in the context of their business, the wider context in their business, which may be national or global. And they don't have a clue about that because they're so busy with the bottom line. And this is where I think coaches... Um, should now have a greater degree of knowledge, general knowledge, than they needed to in the early days. I think that's oh, right, the okay, biggest yeah. change that, that, that coaches are having to face today. So you, so not just looking at how you can improve yourself as a coach and like the, the core coaching skills, but also looking at seeing what's happening in the world that could potentially affect the clients that you're working with. Yeah, and that might be legislation or it might be, um, a, you know, a nuclear disaster as Japan or anything. I mean, I think that, that people generally, and I mean corporate leaders, 
need to be much more agile today to be able to respond to changing circumstances because circumstances are changing very, very frequently today with the way they used compared to the way they used to. I mean, uh, you know, several years ago, we could pretty well say, well, this is what's going to happen about this time next year. Mm. And we can't say that anymore. There's too many things that are changing, you know. And um, so we need to be different. We need different skills to be able to respond to those things. And I think our our leaders and our coaches need to, uh, they need to be really up to date with what's going on in the world. And I imagine uh, having, having that skill to think on their feet as well, because, you know, if you're seeing a coach, there might be something that comes up that you weren't aware of, but you would have to think on your feet to, uh, to bring up knowledge that you've, you know, accumulated yeah. to, to bring that into the conversation. It's crucially important that, and I think some coaches... They, they apply the sort of uh, rules of coaching um, a little bit too rigidly, and they restrict themselves in some way with those. And I think okay. that's quite damaging. I, I feel that I need to be able to, to use um, anything within my knowledge um, basis um, to help the, the, the person that I'm working with. Okay, so I was wondering whether you can talk about um, transpersonal coaching and where it's best applied. Well, um, transpersonal coaching is, is simply um, a, a part of personal development. Nice. I mean, the, the difference between, for example, the Western world is that we put sort of psychology and sometimes even personal development uh, fits into a particular box. And then uh, spiritual development is in a different box. Mm. And in Asia, for example... Um, the personal development is psychological and then as you continue to develop yourself it moves into the spiritual area just uh, uh, sequentially just as you go on that journey we uh, put ourselves in these separate boxes and Asians are more open to a continuous process and of course what is happening I think is more and more people are looking at the more um, uh, leading edge aspects of personal development now mm. and are finding the spiritual side opening up to them. And then, of course, some people are afraid of that or some people say, oh, well, that's religious or something, which doesn't have to be religious at all, but it's, it's personal development, you know. But um, I think there's, there's a lot of new area opening up there that I think people need. I go as far as to say that I think every single coach ought to have transpersonal training um, to be able to deal with people um, who who have that vision, mm. uh, who may be, uh, may be foreigners or may be indeed be English people. Um, and I think that's vitally important that they bring that in as part of their skills. It will be necessary. And did you find when you, when you discuss this with um, with people within business, are they quite open to the idea of bringing in some type of spiritual aspect, or are they are they quite close to the idea before you explain it in, in full to them? Well, I, I think the the advantage of transpersonal psychology, the word transpersonal means um, beyond the personal or uh, bigger than the personal. So in a sense. Um, Family therapy is transpersonal because you're not dealing with just the, the problem child. You're dealing with the whole family. So that's, a, that's transpersonal in itself. But okay. transpersonal coaching generally to a lot of people implies um, the, 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 the spiritual part of, of, of life. So it's simply beyond the individual. And um, the, the advantage of transpersonal, you see, you don't, you're not using a threatening word like spiritual because some people are sort of scared of that word. So mm. we're simply saying going beyond the individual. And, uh, and, and when we are training coaches to use transpersonal psychology, we go step at a time. Right. And I haven't found anyone who, even if they are not particularly on a spiritual journey, who has had any objections to the, to the process we use in the transpersonal training. It's very, very valuable training. Right, okay. So throughout your, throughout your coaching career, um, who or what has been your main influences to how your coaching looks today? Well, I suppose I, I would go back again to, to, the, to the value of the, the early days in the, in the, um, 
in the uh, psychological or psychotherapeutic processes I had. I mean, I was in California at Esalen Institute, which is where a lot of these things began. And mm. I mean, for example, Carl Rogers was on the staff when I was there. And, uh, and that whole process of Rogerian uh, uh, coaching is, 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 is being focused on the, on, the, on the recipient of the coaching rather than on yourself. That was right, what okay. Carl Rogers was really focused on, and he was at Esalen Institute at that time when we were doing therapy. You know, so, that so you were quite you were quite lucky that you had a, a nice framework to start with when you were starting your career, and it kind of like built on that. Well, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it was a very exciting time because that was the period where these new psychologies were being explored. So we, we were involved with actually exploring them. And they, well, so they weren't just applying it. They were actually trying it out on us, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and the, the relationship between that and coaching is absolute, you know. And I think that um, there's still um, quite a lot of what I call primitive backward psychology in the psychotherapeutic business. Yes. Um, in the sense that, um, you know, uh, uh, what we're talking about moves way beyond behavioral psychology, which is just dealing with behavior, not the, not the underlying feelings. And mm. uh, so I think that coaching uh, is, is ahead of the game in many ways. Of course, coaching, as we call coaching today, is way ahead of what's done in sport, as I said earlier, because sport largely is still instruction. Mm. Although I will say, for example, the great success of the British cyclists at, uh, at, uh, in the Chinese Olympics uh, mm. was, was very high. Now, they, uh, uh, Peters and Dave Brailsford, uh, were um, the two psychologists that worked with them, and they had very similar processes to the inner game, and that accounted oh, okay. for their success. So it started, um, it started to drip into the sport, how, how you kind well, of envisage coaching and... Yeah, absolutely, but it's, these things are very slow, you know, I mean, you can, you, you can have successes, and I mean, there are extraordinary successes, and that cycling is only one of them, but um, we've got many more extraordinary successes with using what I would call proper coaching now, mm. and yet the establishment is so reluctant to change. And the old establishment in sport is, is 30 years out of date, to be honest. <laughs> you know, it's all the money in football. They're mm. not coaching as, as, as they should be. And uh, it's the same in education. There's all sorts of things being done in, in, in uh, uh, you know, education that is, is outdated. Mm. Um, and, and driver education is absolutely appalling. They've still got things in, in, in driver education that were based on their handbook. It was written in 1934. Absolutely. Well, I...